Hi everybody, uh, my name is Don Dixon and I want to welcome you back to our discussion on uh, the 17 different types of structure. Uh, there's been a lot of good feedback so far about the master class and we've already concluded uh, our study on, on bars. We talked about a three-sided bar, two-sided bar, one-sided bar. And we've completed that study and we're moving on now to our next category of structure which is humps and when we begin talking about humps I want to establish right off the bat that all humps won't produce fish and I'm going to explain why as we go through this however all other things being equal as I look at all the bars we studied and all that we're going to study in the future man-made stuff all other things being equal I consider humps to be our greatest structure are, they're our best structure. Even though all of them won't produce, the ones that will produce are our best structure. And the reason is pretty simple. As we studied, for instance, a three-sided bar, which we just concluded, it had uh, deep water on three sides, off the two sides and off the end. But a hump has deep water on all four sides. So when you give a fish four different shots at a migration route, it's just better than three. It's better than a two-sided bar where they only have two shots at it. It's certainly better than a one-sided bar. So as we get into this study, understand that all humps won't produce, but still, all other things being equal. As we look at all of the different types of structures, humps are by far the best. With deep water on four sides, it gives the fish four different shots at a migration route. So they just have the best chance of producing fish. We love a good hump, but they have to meet a few qualifications first. And that's what I want to talk about to begin our study on humps. In all of our previous discussions on structure, we have this first qualifying statement that in order for a structure to be good, it must lead all the way from the shallows all the way to deep water. And we really emphasize the deep water because when we were talking about a three-sided bar, we know it leads from the shallows, it leads from the bank to deep water. And most other structures, when we talk about it and use that qualifying statement, we're, we're really emphasizing the deep water side of it. But when we talk about humps, we have to be sure that we emphasize both sides of our qualifying statement. Does it lead from the shallows? all the way to deep water. And the reason I say that is uh, humps aren't uh, on the bank. They're, they don't, they're not sitting up there on the shoreline. We have fish going crazy. I'm sitting out here on the dock and it <laughs> just went nuts. We've got some shallow fish this morning. Actually, there's some fish spawning. That's what it is. Anyway, I'm going to get back to it now. Uh, these humps are not on the shoreline. They're sitting out in the water surrounded by deep water four sides. So we have to establish whether a hump will produce or whether it won't. Does it lead all the way from the shallows to deep water? If it doesn't, it's not going to produce. So that's our qualifier as we begin our study on humps. It's got to lead all the way. Now as we take a look, as we begin our study, we're taking a look at our three main types of humps. What we call our pure humps. Right, sitting out there in the middle of the lake, sitting out there in deep water, sitting in the shallows, but they're surrounded by deeper water on all four sides. So as we look at these main humps, first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, that shallow water hump, that was our first study hump. Does it lead all the way from the shallows to the deep? Well, it's sitting in the shallows, so the shallow part's good, but it doesn't lead to deep water. And then when we look at the deep water hump, conversely, a hump that we find out there uh, sitting in 60 feet of water with maybe a crown or where it tops off is about 30, 35 feet, something like that. It meets the last qualification, at least to deep water, but it doesn't lead from the shallows to deep water. Now remember, we talked about we have a separation point in all of our discussions. We have a separ separation point in our lake. And we separate it into two different classifications, shallow and deep. 
Now, the definition of shallow water, Buck Perry says, the definition is anything 8 to 10 feet or shallower is shallow water. That qualifies as shallow water. And anything deeper than 10 feet is defined as the deep water. So when we look at this deep water hump, it doesn't lead to the shallows because it doesn't lead to 10 feet or less. So as we look at our three main structures, the only one we have left is that mid-lake hump, the one sitting out here in the middle of this lake, that comes up to, let's say, and crowns at a depth of three or four or five feet. Well, it leads to the shallows. And let's say it leads right to deep water. So it does meet the first qualification, shallows to the deep. So we're going to investigate. And right here I'm going to bring up one more qualifier that normally I wouldn't talk about until we get to map and interpretation. But in the case of humps, it's important that I bring it out right now. So we really have to have two questions answered if we want to spend time working on a particular hump. If we find that mid-leg hump, which I just described, crowns at three feet, leads all the way to 60 feet. First qualifier handled. The next thing we have to know is what is the final break into that deep water. In other words, it just wouldn't be three feet, 60 feet, that'd be a silo. <laughs> uh, so if it crowns at three feet, let's just say for our sake of this hypothetical that it just starts sloping off and gets to five, six, seven feet on top, eight feet, and finally at a depth of 12 feet, it breaks to a depth of about 17 feet, pretty sharp, and then it goes for a little way, 17, 18, 19, 20 feet, and then breaks at 20 feet into the 60 feet. The final break in that case would be 20 feet. That would be the drop off, 20 feet to the deep water. So now we've met two qualifications that we've got to have. First, it leads all the way, and secondly, and this goes for any structure, for it to be productive, it must have a final break into deep water at at least a depth of 14 to 17 feet. That's the minimum. The deeper that final break is, the better we like. Now let's go back and review what I just said about the three types of pure humps. The first one's in shallow water, but it doesn't lead to deep. The next one conversely is in deep water but it doesn't crown at a shallow depth. So at first glance it appears that two out of our three main type humps won't produce fish. They don't meet the very first qualifying statement. They don't lead all the way. So the question comes up at this point, well if that's the case two out of our three main type of humps don't meet the first qualif qualifier. Why in the heck do you, have you and I caught fish off all three of those humps? We've already caught fish off of those humps, probably more than one time. So how is that possible? It seems to be a contradiction. I said it won't produce, but yet we've all fished those and we've caught fish. Let me explain exactly why that is. Our first hump that we discussed is the one that's sitting in shallow water. Now if I took that hump and set it out in the middle of this lake, out on a 10 foot flat, it crowns at three feet and set it out there on a 10 foot flat, 200 or 300 yards away from any deep water. It will not produce fish. It doesn't qualify. But if I take that shallow hump and I bring it in here somewhere and put it on a big bar that runs out there and does lead to deep water, I put it right in the center of that bar, we can catch fish off of that hump. Because now that hump is sitting on a structure that does in fact lead all the way from the shallows to the deep. Now in that situation that hump, that shallow water hump in that case would really be properly referred to as a break on structure. But would we catch fish off that shallow hump? Yes, on, on certain weather and water conditions seasonally we'd be catching fish off of that hump for sure. Even though at our first glance it doesn't qualify. And then the other structure the deep water hump that I said would be a dead end for the fish, it doesn't lead to the shallows. At least to the deep, it doesn't lead to the shallows. But let me take that hump and tie it through some deep break lines to a shoreline related bar 
that does in fact lead all the way. Now we have a productive deep hump because it's connected to a structure that does lead all the way. And I can tell you, hundreds of times in my 40 years, I've been doing some detail mapping off a shoreline bar. Drops down into a deeper depth and all of a sudden as I'm taking my soundings, it starts getting shallower instead of deeper. And I've come just smack dab right up on top of a deep water hump, sitting right off that bar. So as we analyze our three basic types of humps, the shallow water hump and the deep water hump, in order for them to produce, since they don't by themselves qualify, for them to produce, they must be on or connected to a structure that does lead all the way. And then they become very important features for us to fish. You know that deep water hump? Uh, I think the next time we get together, I'm going to tell you a story about one. But on that deep water hump, if it's crowning, let's say, at 32 feet, breaking into 70, and the bar where I caught my first fish over here 10 minutes ago was breaking at 17 feet. Well, the fish may not get to 17 feet. They may not get to the end of the bar at 24 feet, but they may become very active down in that sanctuary zone, and I'm catching them off to the top of that hump. At 32 feet. I might catch them there 50 times before I ever catch one off the end of the bar. Even though in order for that hump to produce it has to be connected to that bar. But we can catch a lot of fish off that deep hump over the summer months and maybe not have the fish move all the way up to the end of the bar maybe two or three times. And that comes under the heading of weather and water. We're going to talk about fish movements a little bit later on in further study, but understand that deep water hump can be your lifesaver. It can be your money maker for sure most of the season, but in order for it to produce, it must be on or connected to another structure that does in fact lead all the way. Okay, before I leave this overall train of thought, I want to go back to the mid lake hump. Let's say if you look out here over my shoulder and we go out there about 400 yards and we discover a hump. This is a mid-lake hump. And let's say it's right beside deep water. Let's give it that. It's right beside the deepest water in the lake. Directly adjacent to the deepest water. And as we discover this hump and I drive over it with my depth sonder, I see that as I drove, drive over at one spot, it's 14 feet deep is the shallowest that it gets before I start going deeper off the other end. Now, 14 foot of water is not the shallows. So if that's as shallow as it is on that hump, it would not produce. Okay, so where I crossed over this hump is 12 feet, it's the shallowest I saw. Now I'm not gonna, let's say I don't have a contour map, I, I don't have any idea if this is gonna qualify or not, but it only came to 14 or 13 feet, something, it didn't qualify. So in order to really find the shallowest spot on that top or the crown of that hump, if I went across east and west, follow me now, I gotta swing the boat way around and head north and south. If I make a, an exact crisscross pass, I will find out what in fact the shallowest spot of that crown or the crown of that uh, hump really is. So let's say if I'm, as I'm making my second pass the other direction, when I get up to the top of the bar, the shallowest I saw was eight feet. Well, all of a sudden now, we have a, a hump that leads from the shallows to the deep. So then the next question, of course, is, uh, as I brought up earlier, I gotta find out what's that final break now off of that hump. And here's why. This is what I didn't explain before I wanna explain to you. You'll understand better when we get into weather and water conditions, but during the summer months, all summer long, for the bulk of the season, you hardly will ever, ever see a movement of fish coming to a depth of eight or nine feet. So that's why we like that final break to be at some deeper depth. Let's say that we find that we have eight feet on top of this hump, but it goes out here and slopes down to 10 feet and then breaks off at 10 feet right into the deep water. It could produce an occasional fish, but I'm not going to waste much time on that hump because 
I don't expect to see the school of fish coming to a depth of 10 feet hardly ever. That's how often that's going to happen. You just don't see it hardly ever for the bulk of the season. So that's why I like that last break to be somewhere 14 to 17 feet, but preferably even deeper, 22, 24, 35, into 60. Then we got something we can hang our hat on. We can fish there all day long. And if a fish is going to get caught, we're going to catch it. Understand the reason, the specific reason for that depth, that deep depth that we need to see where it's breaking the last break. That's the last spot you and I can fish. It's our last target. You know how Buck always talked about, uh, you know, we're going to put you on the exact spot. We're going to be fishing that exact spot in deep water, that exact target in deep water. Well, our target, that exact spot, is the contact point or the drop off at the very last thing we can see happening before the, the structure disappears into the deep hole. Wherever that number is, that's the last spot we can fish. So if this imaginary hump we just talked about crowns at 8 feet and leaves it deep, that's qualified. But if it only breaks at 11 or 12 feet into that deep water, I don't like it very much. It can produce a fish or two, but I'm not going to spend much time on it. I want to find that one that's breaking at least at 14 to 17 feet and preferably deeper. So now that we have our three types of main humps discussed. Let me review what we've said. In order for the shallow water hump or the deep water hump to produce, it's got to be on or connected to a structure that leads all the way from the shallows all the way to deep water. Simple? That's a simple way of saying it. So if your deep hump is sitting out there next to 60 feet of water and it's not connected to anything, it won't produce. It just won't produce. So the deep hump has to be connected, the shallow hump has to be connected, and the one out in the mid leg, the mid leg hump, it's got a crown shallow and break at a good depth, and now we've got a total understanding of the three main types of humps. Now the next question that comes up is how do we find these humps? Obviously we can't see them, they're underwater. So what are some good reliable ways to locate humps? First, your best friend is a contour map. And on a contour map, if you're not used to reading them, uh, a hump is designated by concentric circles, circles within each other, and they're enclosed. And in really good detail uh, contour maps, they'll actually mark the depth of the crown of the hump. I've read many maps where I see the, see the hump uh, with the circles, you know, the contour line circles. And then on the last circle, on the inside, there'll be a, there'll be a number, eight feet, four feet. And that gives me the crown, or at least that's what it was at that uh, water level. And that gives you a head start on, on finding your three basic types of humps. The other way uh, to find the mid-lake humps, and I think it's important to mention here that mostly it's these humps that we're talking about, these mid-lake humps, they're mostly found in the glacier type natural lakes. Uh, and one of the real keys in finding underwater humps or underwater islands is when you see a lot of islands above water. If you're seeing above water islands, it's a guarantee you have underwater islands or humps in that area. So that's a good observation of terrain, you're looking for humps. Okay, and another good way of finding these mid-lake humps, they're the, really the hardest ones to find. They're sitting out there somewhere near that deep hole or that deep channel, and we can't see them. However, in most natural glacier lakes, there's weed lines. There's submergent and emergent weeds. And many times, I'd be sitting, i just look out over this lake, and I'll see a complete change in the color of the water in a certain area. And what it is, is where the submergent weeds have come up, like let's just say in your lake it's within one foot of the surface. It creates a different color of water that you can actually see if you're looking for it. 
and when you run over to that different watercolor that you're looking at 99 times out of 100 it's a hump with grass growing and so if your weed lines at 10 feet you know you've got a potentially product productive hump it leads to the shallows so contour map observation of terrain observation of the watercolor uh, when I say observation of terrain, you be sure to notice when you notice those above water islands, you have some underwater islands. And then in the end, of course, your, your depth sonder is going to give you the final answer to finding these humps. But as we look at all three, always keep in mind, as we analyze the three basic type humps, in order for them to produce fish, and I started off by telling you, by the way, that all humps won't produce, and they won't. And I don't want to see you out there fishing, spending an hour, hour and a half, two hours fishing a hump that's never going to have a fish. So keep this in mind. The two humps the, on the both ends, the shallow water hump and the deep water hump, they must be connected in some way to a structure that leads all the way. Because by themselves, they don't lead all the way. And then the mid-lake hump got to lead from the shallows all the way to deep and have a good final break and then we're in business. So once again, I appreciate you uh, coming with me along this journey, and hopefully it's going to improve your fishing come the season. So like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I'll see you the next time.